Hello, so, um, yeah, I'm just gonna make a quick video. I know the lighting is a bit um, rubbish in here at the minute and it's looking kind of pixelated on the screen. I can't really do much about that because my light is um, bad in my room. I'm actually at home at the minute, so I'm not at uni. And, um, yeah, I've got an essay due in on Wednesday on sophism. Um, so I'm just going to talk through a few ideas. Um, and a lot of the ideas I haven't actually fully figured out yet. That's the point in making the video so that I can figure out exactly what I think. Um, so the question is, um, in what sense are sophists both humanists and nihilists? Okay, so obviously I'm going to start off by defining my terms. Um, so a sophism, for sophism um, were a group of, well sophists were a group of ancient Greek philosophers. Um, the term was derogatory but we could say it means wise men but what what the what they actually were interested in wasn't wisdom and truth and um, for its own sake rather wisdom and knowledge that they could then apply to practical disciplines but not only apply to um pract um to practical endeavors uh rather they would sell their knowledge to other people for a price for money um so they're almost commodifying this sacred knowledge <laughs> um I guess you could see it like that, which made people um, suspicious of them, not like them. And if someone was to be accused of being a sophist, it wasn't, it wasn't a good thing. Um, but yeah, sophist. Um, so the word sophia comes from is the Greek word I believe for wisdom. So wise men. But yeah, um, they're not wise in the, I guess the traditional philosophical sense. Um, so that. Right, and I'll also say that sophism doesn't necessarily provide us with one um, body of knowledge or one doctrine. It's not that type of thing. It's um, it's more like a, a label given to people um, who perhaps fit a certain criteria. So, for instance, the selling of knowledge, um, which isn't necessary, but um, that is that was the typical thing that sophists did. They sold their teaching. Um, another thing that they typically did was that they um, rejected the existence of external reality or objective truth. So they would um, make claims such as the Protagorean claim, which was man is the measure of all things. And this essentially means that man is at the central point of inquiry and the objective world around man um, holds no real truth to it. Because if man is the measure of all things, then God, or the world in and of itself at an atomic level, is not the measure of itself. Rather, how men perceive that to be is how it is. Um, so, we could say this leads to a problem. Like, what if there is conflicting views, then would that not um, lead to like a fallacy um, due to the law of non-contradiction? Because if you believe that the apple is red and I believe that the same apple is green then both of those things can't be right surely um but according to Protagoras those two things can be right because um both men perceive the apple in a particular way we can't know the apple in and of itself the apple in and of itself actually lacks a nature um so the way that both men see the apple is the right way to see the apple and probably simultaneously the wrong way to see the apple as well, uh, which is sort of Heraclitian in some ways. So the apple is both red and green, and that is, doesn't cause any contradiction, according to Protagoras, um, which is strange. Um, he believes, and the reason he believes this is because he sees that there's always two sides to, um, say, one argument, at least two sides to, to one question. And he thinks that both of those sides have a point to make and that point doesn't necessarily correlate with a reality rather it just it's sort of like a language game um to use fitz terms um so we play certain language games with the words that we use and and the aim of using our words is merely to persuade people of our particular worldview it's not to make true statements about the objective nature of reality rather it's to um persuade people into perceiving the way that we perceive the world, into believing that, into following us. And the reason that's important is because in Greece at the time, it was, um, I guess, the beginnings of democracy. And democracy requires 
several different parties or participants or individuals who were perhaps um, wanting power. And how you get power in democracy is by winning over the majority. So those who had the greatest persuasive techniques, or we could call those rhetorical skills, skills of rhetoric which were taught and sold by the, by the sophists, um, would get the greatest following. And that would mean that they would get power. And that would mean that they were persuading people of their particular worldview. Um, but that doesn't mean that what they're saying is objectively true. It just means that it's... Well, Protagoras would say, um, we have to judge worldviews and ideas based on the utility they have. So, an idea... Ideas aren't necessarily more true than other ideas. Rather, some ideas are more useful than others. So, for instance, um, if we have um, a doctor, and the doctor's job is to treat a patient. Now, if we were true, truly relativistic, we could say, well, it doesn't matter what the doctor does, because the doctor could treat the patient with poison, or the doctor could treat the patient with medicine. Like, well, that doesn't seem to make any sense. It, it, it's clearly true that one of those ideas is better than the other. Well, Protagoras would say that neither one is necessarily better or more true. Rather, one of them is more useful. Um, so, for instance, and I guess that's based on a definition of the word treat. So when you say treat, what you mean is, I guess, to reduce suffering, um, reduce pain, um, increase a lifespan, um, prevent death. Okay, so in that sense, you know that if you give the patient poison, the poison will kill them, which is doing the opposite of treating them. So you have to give the patient um, the medicine in order to treat them and make them better, because it would almost cause a logical contradiction within the particular language game if you were to give them poison. Okay, but then that is essentially just on a linguistic level. I guess that's where the, the sophist would stop, or that's where Protagoras would stop. He wouldn't say there's any objective truth to that. He wouldn't say it's necessarily better that someone actually lives and, and um, as opposed to dies. Um, rather, within a particular language game, and again, I'm just using the word language game, that is a contemporary idea, but I'm applying the Wittgensteinian contemporary 20th century idea to um, a very old idea, so a very old um, thinker, which was from the 5th century uh, BC. Um, so just to clear that up. Okay, um, I'm not sure I fully explained that properly. I was trying to figure out that example last night a little bit, but um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, so, right. So the question, as I said, was um, in what sense are the sophists both humanists and nihilists? Right, so I've explained sophists. I've also explained some of the sophists' ideas. So man is the measure of, of all things. Man is the centre of po the pivotal point of inquiry, the centre of reality. The external or noumenal world around us has no true meaning to it. All meaning is within here, within our phenomenological framework. It's what we attribute to it. It's what we perceive to be true and right and wrong. And that's what gives reality definition and meaning. Okay, so in that sense, the sophists are humanists because they put humans at the centre of reality as opposed to the cosmos at the centre of reality, which is very interesting because if you take into account the fact that the majority of the Greek philosophers before the sophists and maybe even some of them afterwards as well were very interested in finding the archi, which is the beginning cause of reality, the first cause, the... <laughs> Um, the building blocks of nature and life and and um, finding some sort of objective metaphysic which could explain um, the world around us rather than explaining ourselves. Um, so there was this, this shift from saying, ah, well, the cause is um, atoms. I think it was Democritus Democ who said um, it was atoms. Um, and then there was um, Anaximander and Thales and I can't remember them all but yeah they were said like oh, it's fire, earth, water um, which is the cause of all things but 
sophists sort of say, well, actually that stuff is irrelevant. What we need to focus on is humans. And this includes human endeavours such as politics and um, education and um, finding the just society, which would essentially be politics. And um, I guess looking at different ways of life and teaching skills in which humans use in order to, um, I guess, earn money or get things done in their particular society. So um, in that sense, it is very humanistic. Um, yeah, <laughs> I feel like I went on a bit of a tangent there. Um, so sophism is definitely humanistic. Okay, it's definitely a humanist um, sort of philosophy because it puts humans at the centre of um, inquiry. Um, but the other part of the question is, are they nihilists? And I would say yes and no. Okay, so there is... And I, I guess if I'm going to say yes and no to this question, then I also have to say yes and no to the initial question of whether or not they are humanists. And I'll go into that in just a second. Um, but there's a, there was a sophist called Gorgias or Gorgias. Gorgias. He was Gorgias. <laughs> no. Um, so there was a sophist called Gorg Gorgias. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but um, that's how I'm going to say it. So anyway, I don't think he'll really mind because he's dead. Long gone. Um, so Gorgias um, was a nihilist. I'm going to say nihilist like that because it's not necessarily the case. He could have just, in his argument, he could have just been um, mocking people. So I'll, I'll outline this argument first, um, very briefly. Um, partially because this is going to cut out soon, I'm rumbling. So, Gorgia said, nothing exists. And then he says, if, even if something did exist, we could not know it. And then he says, even if we could know it, then we would not be able to communicate it. So, this is like absolute nihilism. This is a rejection of external reality in and of itself. Now, in some ways, this is paradoxical, because he is saying nothing exists. Yet, we can use Cartesian reasoning to critique this idea that he's putting forth. Okay, so we can refute his argument using Cartesian reasoning. Because, presumably, he is something. Because to be something is to exist. Okay, by nature. If you are something, you must exist. Right. Um, Gorgias is able to doubt his existence. Doubt existence itself, saying nothing exists. He is in existence, therefore he is doubting his own existence. Right. But the fact that he is able to first doubt his existence implies that he must first exist. Therefore, Gorgias is essentially wrong in, in the doubting of the existence. All he does is perhaps play a language game. Um, he's not saying anything about reality. All he's saying is that he he doesn't exist that's all he's saying okay it's just language but he can't say he doesn't exist or doubt his existence without first existing therefore he exists and reality exists um but yeah so this is sort of where it goes further so this gets kind of complicated so the sophists were teachers of rhetoric okay they were um teaching people different skills of argumentation in order to be able to um fight for what they believe in to protect their worldview to to attempt to persuade people of their worldview and the sophists who had the the greatest rhetorical skills or were the most persuasive would presumably make the most money now it's possible that gorgias was not just doing this for other sophists, but also other philosophers in general. He was mocking their argument. He was mocking their ability to make an argument that was so absurd, yet seemingly had some truth to it, but then it also couldn't have had truth to it, because as I've just explained, his argument was absurd. Um, so perhaps he was, he was just... Um, he was just mocking philosophy in general. The fact that we can make arguments and come to absurd conclusions about reality. And that is possible. However, I don't feel like I know enough about that to be able to fully flesh it out. Um, but that's all I want to talk about for now. Because I'm literally running out of recording time. Um, I'll probably come back later and make another, maybe part two or something. But yeah, um, thank you for watching.